Thanks for joining today. Uh, today we are going to talk about um, CSI Forensic and CSI Container. This is actually the second episode on this kind of series that we started last year here in uh, SecurityCon. Um, so let's dive, uh, just see what we're going to see today. Uh, so we're going to just uh, say a couple of words on DFIR, what is DFIR and container DFIR. This is something that we covered already in the last episode, just doing a couple of words and then we'll move on to the Kubernetes checkpoint, which will be our main focus for today. And then we'll see what we can do with, with Kubernetes checkpoint and then we'll close with some takeaways. So, uh, previous, previously on CSI container, as we said, uh, we, we did a talk last year uh, related to this topic. Um, we're just going to see a couple of things, but I'll let you go through the, uh, to the overall talk if you are interested in and if you, if you weren't there last year. Uh, unfortunately, today we can just keep the intro because, of course, we have some uh, important couple of things that we need to set up uh, in order to understand the other part of the talk. So, sorry about that, but I'm, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, so, let's start talking about the FIR and what is the FIR and why we talk about the FIR. So, what is the FIR? It's Digital Forensics Plus Instant Response. Um, digital forensics are all the activities done in order to uh, collect data, collect logs, collect activity user, um, user activities, and so on, in order to proceed with analysis and understand what the attacker did, uh, which was the goal, and kind of bringing together pieces to understand w the overall picture. Uh, incident response instead are all the activities done in order from preparation to fixing and uh, resolving the issue. Uh, so all the things in the middle that we do are all related or, or when the, the attack is performed is all, uh, is all under the uh, incident response activities. Uh, nowadays, we talk about the FIR because, of course, all the tools that we use are very capable and they are kind of all together. Uh, and we have like super powerful tool that get, give us the chance to do all both digital forensic and incident response. So back in time, those two practices were uh, very separated. Now it makes sense to keep them all together since we have tools that give us the chance to do that. Uh, just a couple of words on what we said on container DFIR. Um, so why we talk about the container DFIR? For obvious reasons, because we might need to do and perform those activities if we get attacked and we need to understand what, what, what happened and how to restore and how to come back and what we need to fix. Um, however, as we know, container are very different from uh, what we used to do on host, and of course, we need to we need different tools, we need dif different best practice. So that's what we cover larger last time. Uh, but long story short, uh, we have different tools that we need to master. We have different tools that we need to to know, and different tools that that we need to understand and use it in order to perform container DFIR, which is different from host and on-prem DFIR. And of course, uh, we need to be ready to use in case we need them. Uh, so let, now let's just go through the basic phases for incident response. Um, there are preparation, which is uh, what we need to do in order to get prepared to receive an attack mainly. So a um, lot of things that you can do. The main part, of course, is collect, collect logs and making sure you have the visibility you need in order to uh, potentially detect attacks uh, if something happened. So in this case, you can use container runtime security tools like Falco and Falco Sidekick to send all the data into log management platform, which in this case could be uh, Elk or, uh, or Elasticsearch. Um, and of course, there might be other tools in CNCF uh, which you can, you can use in container in order to log to uh, logging and send log then uh, like FluentBit and FluentD. Uh, next phase is detection analysis. This is when the attack is already on. So you need to run, you need to uh, use your tools that you have been preparing in the past, hopefully, so that you are ready to, uh, to detect and, and react as fast as possible. 
And of course, uh, once you, you have the detection and you start understanding what is going on, uh, you start uh, isolating things. Uh, it might be into the container, it might already be outside the container, it's already in the host, so you might need to do different things. You might need to cordon the node if needed, or REST is already on cloud, so you need to also have visibility into cloud as well. Uh, and this is the phase where you start collecting uh, all the evidence that you might need in order for, um, for digital forensic, as we saw before. So snapshotting, uh, retrieve commits, retrieve uh, logs that might need it, and so on. And of course, the last phase is fixing, where you know where, the, where was the, um, the, CV, the, uh, the vulnerability or the misconfiguration, so you need to act on fixing that in order to um, be safe next time. So that's what we discussed last year. Um, have a look at this if you want to know more. And now we, I think we are ready for the next episode about this series about uh, Kubernetes uh, the, um, CSI. So as we said, um, Kubernetes checkpoint is the main focus for today. Um, Kubernetes is something that we, are, we, we discussed briefly last year as well, but this year I think we wanted to move a bit farther and we, a bit deeper into what we can do with, with Kubernetes Checkpoint. Uh, for who is not familiar with Kubernetes Checkpoint, is a feature that was added in Kubernetes in version 125 in, as, alpha, as, as alpha version and is in 130 is in beta. Uh, is in beta, uh, so it's, it's still early stage, uh, and there are still some limitations that we will highlight during the presentation today, uh, but it's still very useful and very and makes sense for what we need to do for the FIR. So just a couple of words on how it works. As you can see, you can think about Checkpoint as a like snapshotting your container so that you can restore somewhere else, uh, and of course, in our case, to do proper um, proper analysis and forensic analysis on it. How it works, uh, it just freeze the process, it goes process by process, and if it is freeze the process, collect the thing that you need, need to be uh, collected, like memory, uh, CPU usage, and other information that might need then to restore into another, another system or, or the same system, of course, it depends on the use case. Uh, in order to do that, underneath, they use ptrace syscall uh, to uh, inject into the process, do all the things that we, that, that we see here on collecting, save memory, and so on, and then unfreeze uh, the process so it can, it can continue. Uh, some limitation uh, that we can say here uh, about container checkpoint, uh, it works on specific container um, on, on uh, container runtime, uh, so it's um, it, it it works on cryo, uh, but is I mean is reliable on cryo. Is still there is still some work that needs to be done on other on different environments. So uh, keep it as in mind when you see it. So it's not like ready for production, but you know is very is very useful. Uh, to understand it and um, and start start working on that, um, but I mean, why we need Kubernetes checkpoint, right? I mean, we start covering about that, uh, but let's think also about um, like limitation that you have if you want to do like live forensic in a in a in a container, right? We know the container how it works, right? The container are very ephemeral, so they stay there for minutes, hours, and then they're just gone. So how you do live forensic in such uh, 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 ephemeral environments? If the pod is not there, it's pretty difficult to do anything, right? Uh, and of course, as we, as we know, but as we noted also in our uh, uh, usage report in 2023, attacks in cloud native are super fast, like five minutes, right? So you need something that give you the chance to properly do this, kind of the same thing that we were doing on on-prem, which was easier on some on the side, uh, but on this side in container, which give us a lot of flexibility and all the fun things that you can do with containers. However, there are also some challenges that you need to, that you need to face. Um, this is mainly how um, uh, Kubernetes Checkpoint API works. Uh, about limitation, as we, as we were talking before, this works on, Kub on Kubelet API, so there isn't in Kubernetes API yet, so you can use it with kubectl at the moment. 
uh, and uh, Creo, which is the main tool uh, that is used and need to be supported by container runtime, um, is uh, need to need to be on the host where you do the checkpoint. So the, those are two main things that you need to remember. Uh, how it works, this is the API. Of course, you need to specify the namespace, the pod name, the container name, where you want to do the checkpoint. And on the bottom, you see the item is created, uh, which is the, the checkpoint. It's creating a tar. And if we uh, delve into what, the, what there is inside the, the checkpoint, we can see a bunch of different files. Um, most of the files are related to metadata or things that can be useful for, to recover. Uh, as we will see later on in the demo. Uh, and of course, there are the checkpoint itself where there are all the information and all the, the checkpoint created by Creo. And most important, there is the root FS diff, which there are all the um, files that have been changed during the container uh, life. So you can see in, in our case, if, if the attacker does something, you will see the file that are dropped into the container, for instance, in the, in the root FS diff. But as I said, we will see later on uh, during the demo. Um, so what we're going to do today. So as we said, Kuber, uh, checkpoint is, sounds like useful. Uh, however, it needs to be done in, with proper timing because container might not be there or it might be too late. right? Uh, so we need something that is automated. So we don't want to stay there like waiting for an attacker and then like run our checkpoint. right? We need something automated. And for this use case, this fits perfectly on what we do with, with FICO and, and Kubernetes response engine, uh, which make you uh, trigger actions after a specific FICO rules is triggered. So in this case, we're going to showcase something with, with response engine made using FICO, FICO sidekick, uh, Argo, in order to uh, automate the action and then uh, calling the Kubernetes checkpoint. Just last part before the demo, uh, for who is not familiar with FICO and FICO syntax, uh, this is a FICO rule. Uh, FICO is a runtime security project, now is graduated, uh, and g give you the chance to look into what is going on inside the container, so runtime visibility on what is going on. Um, FICO uh, trigger alerts based on events, uh, and FICO evaluates uh, FICO rules and trigger events if the condition is, is matched. In this case, for the purpose of the, of the demo, we're going to use the detect outbound connection to malicious IP. Uh, just going through the, the syntax is pretty easy. Um, FICO rule, there are I have different fields, there are description. Uh, the main uh, point of the rule, of course, is the condition, which is what need to match in order to trigger the alert. Uh, in this case, it's just a connection uh, in container, so we are reinforcing that this is uh, coming in, into a container, and the, the, the IP is into the list, uh, malicious IPs, uh, FICO support list, and also support macros, which uh, make it like more, more a readable condition and is easier to read, and of course there is output and tags in order to uh, filter the rules if needed, and so on. So I'll let Alberto go in through the demo, and then we'll uh, move on. Thanks. Thank you, Stefano, for the introduction. So, um, before starting with the demo, um, now we, uh, I mean, we are just trying to focus in on this kind of functionality in order to understand how this experimental approach can be used in order to set the stage for um, the FAR. Uh, and in order to give you some more context, uh, you will see here on the left hand of this slide, of, of this video, uh, a Kubernetes cluster, a Kubernetes prod environment where we have basically installed the response engine uh, and we have enabled the checkpointing feature. And instead, on the right hand of this video, you will see what, the, what an attacker sees. Basically, a misconfigured Jupyter pod, uh, a, a misconfigured Jupyter UI that allows the attacker to run some, um, some malware, and also the IRC client that allows the attacker to communicate with, the, with this victim. So let's start. 
You can see that, I, uh, or I mean, I, I hope you can see it, but here uh, we, uh, we are in a Kubernetes prod cluster. Uh, I'm just listing the pod and in, in the Jupy namespace, and as you can see here, the attacker has access to the same kind of names, uh, to the same kind of pod that we have just listed. And from there, he is able to download a Perlbot script that then is able to execute. And listing the processes running, you can see this fake system, the process that is the IRC bot that we have just spawned. And uh, if you see the IRC client uh, here on the low side of the slide, you can see that this identifier and WP15064 has just joined the channel. So this basically means that the client, the victim pod, has just connected to the IRC server. Now, if we try to list the content of the world Kubernetes cluster, you can see that um, there are two uh, kind of news. The first one is that the Jupyter has just terminate, terminated. And uh, on the other side, you can see is that, that, I mean, from the attacker's perspective, that the, um, this identifier has just quitted the IRC channel. And the reason for this is because of the fact that the malicious execution that was uh, triggered by the attacker has just raised an alert in Falco. Falco notified the, the, this kind of malicious execution to Falco Sidekick. Falco Sidekick raised uh, um, this event that was handled by Argo, and Argo created this checkpoint pod. You can see that it uh, has basically completed, and the, the task of this checkpoint pod is to basically handle the Falco alert that was received, and then to checkpoint the victim container. So, taking a look at the logs, you can see that the, uh, I mean, I just blurred it because uh, it was very verbose logging, but as you can see here, uh, there is the Falco alert that was raised, and um, it was basically the same kind of alert uh, of rule that Stefano showed you before that was retrieved by the Argo sensor. And the, uh, this uh, event was then parsed by the checkpoint pod that was able to get the namespace, get the pod name, and then get the container in order to know which kind of pod, which container has to be checkpointed. And this execution was basically done here. You, here you can see that the checkpoint container archive was just created, and right after that, we adopted a conservative approach. We decided to terminate the pod that was impacted by the attack. So just to close it, this, I'm basically listing the, the content of the varlib kubelet uh, path in, just to make sure that the checkpoint was created. So let's now try to recap so that we can understand how we can move on with this. We have an attacker that exploited this misconfigured Jupyter interface. It has targeted this victim pod. Falco was able to raise an event, and with Argo, it was able to create this checkpoint pod. The checkpoint pod is authorized to communicate with Kubelet, where that pod was scheduled, and was able to checkpoint the container. So it has created a checkpoint archive, and right after that, it has communicated with the API server in order to terminate the pod. So now we have the archive. And the question is, what can we do with this checkpointed container? The, uh, before moving to this uh, kind of question and before moving to the DFAR part, it is important to stress how we need to preserve this uh, archive that we have just created. So store it in order to keep it safe. We can also uh, interact, I mean, make this kind of checkpointing feature interact with other kind of automation, for example, in order to build the, the, the checkpoint container that we have just created, and we will see it later. But uh, it is also important to assess in parallel to this checkpointed container other kind of entities that may have been impacted, like, for example, the service account mounted to the container, if any, or even some kind of cloud role associated to the pod, or any kind of device mounted. However, we will now focus only on the workload that we have just checkpointed. So 
We have the checkpoint and we have basically two main ways. The first one is, uh, uh, I mean, a bit more time consuming and may require some expertise in order to understand what happened within the checkpointed container. The second one is a bit more engaging and um, maybe a bit more quick, but it is not always reliable because of the current checkpoint limitations that we will explain later. So let's start from the static analysis. As Stefano said before, the checkpointed container contains not only metadata related th that allows us to do the restoring operation, but also contains all the kind of files that have been downloaded at runtime within the container. So starting from it, it is possible, of course, to understand which files have been downloaded um, in respect to the, I mean, base image from which the container was created. Of course, some of these may be not as simple as Perl files, uh, Perl file like in this case, but may require some expertise in order to um, reverse engineer the, the binary that was launched. However, there are different kind of tools that the Cryo project has delivered in order to uh, study the checkpoint archive that was created, or better, the checkpoint container. Uh, so one of these is checkpoint CTL that, for example, allows us to retrieve the information about the checkpointed container. And also, for, exp for example, it is able to print out the process tree with dual commands, with the environment variables if you want to, or also with the sockets that were involved during the checkpointing operation. It is also possible to retrieve the mounts. And among these mounts, there is, for example, the service account that in this case was mounted by default. And this can allow us to to um, do another investigation in order to make sure if, for example, the service account mounted to that Jupyter container was able to interact with the Kubernetes API server and to potentially um, cause some disruption in the Kubernetes cluster or something like it. It is also possible to analyze the container memory of the process that was executed, of the malicious process that was executed with the man parse uh, subcommand that allows, for example, to dig deeper into the process ID that was uh, that, that is malicious. Or it is also possible to use some other specific files for the checkpointing feature, uh, specific um, utilities for the checkpointing features that allows to parse the content of cryo image files that was responsible for the checkpoint. And among these files, for example, there is also the, um, the checkpoint was able also to store the raw memory pages. So this basically means that you're not only able to retrieve or to get the environment variables that were used by the container, but you are also potentially able to retrieve what's, what was in memory. And in this case, I was able to, for example, get all the interaction that my IRC bot, so the victim, was able to, uh, I mean, the, all the interaction that the, the bot had with the server. And this also potentially could allow us to get all the interaction with any attacker that has sent messages to this, uh, to this victim container. There is also the possibility to use core dump. There is another utility provided by the CRIU tool, but it, even if it, it is uh, a bit more complex to, to build and to use, and these then give you from the checkpoint a core dump file that you should able then to parse with GDP. But it's now time for maybe the most engaging part, that is the dynamic analysis. So once you have checkpointed the container, you might be able also to restore it. It is not so trivial, also because um, it is hard at the moment to restore a pod, or, uh, or at least restore a container that was checkpointed by a different kind of container engine or container runtimes. There are some uh, metadata issues, um, as far as we know, but it is a thing if you, for example, as we did in our case, using two clusters with the same kind of container engine, container runtime, the same kind of features and version enabled, we, will ab we were able to checkpoint and restore in another cluster as we are going to show in a while. But 
reproducing and restoring this pod in another, in another environment, like in a sandboxed machine or cluster, requires, of course, some kind of strategies in order to reduce the, um, the re any security risk, like, for example, any kind of privilege escalation or um, sensitive information being stolen from the restore pod once you are able to restore it into a staging cluster, like uh, we are going to do. And also, in order to do this kind of dynamic analysis, it is required to adopt some tools that give you low-level visibility on network connections, on, for example, syscalls get being executed or pick-off loads um, within the, uh, the sandboxed machine. So, in order to, de to do the restore first, before jumping into the demo, it is required to launch some build commands. So, build up. Uh, allows you to basically build a new container image starting from the checkpoint archive. And from there, you are able to build this image, push it to your own Docker registry, for example, and then apply this new image um, in order to run a new pod. It's time for the daemon. Um, so here I'm just resuming the same kind of execution we had before. I'm now listing the varlib kubelet checkpoints in order to make sure that we have the checkpoint that we have previously created. We are always in the same cluster we, uh, in which we were before, so the Kubernetes prod. And as you can see here, uh, now I'm just copying the checkpoint archive into this into another folder where I have the restore script that is able to automate those build commands that I showed you before. And running this script, setting the, the, the uh, specifying the checkpoint file path and also the checkpoint name that I want to give to my new image, I'm able to build it, I'm able to push it to my own Docker registry. And as you can see, I've just created this image in Docker Hub uh, with checkpoint Jupyter container name. And now I'm jumping into another cluster that, as you can see, is um, a Kubernetes staging cluster uh, that has different kind of resources, but the same kind of settings in order to allow a smoother restoring uh, operation. And here I have this restore pod YAML where I'm going to reference the checkpoint image that I've just uh, built and pushed. And from there, uh, once I apply this kind of restored pod, I am now able, as you can see, to see on the left, the pod being in, uh, I mean, going into a running state. And instead, uh, on the right side, you can see that the previous identifier for the boat that we ran on the Kubernetes, I mean, that was executed by the attacker on the previous cluster, has just joined the channel again. And what's cool about it is not only that the whole process tree was resumed, but also that, of course, the connection in this case was restored. So the, um, the, the container that I just resumed was able to connect, again, the, uh, the IRC server that he was communicating with before. And that also the identifier of this bot, that it is usually ra random, is uh, the same one as before. And at the end, if you can also, for example, open the shell uh, in order to see that the process tree is exactly the same one as before. Now, we have seen uh, how the restoring works. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so um, here there are some issue. However, um, now in order to understand how the um, sorry for this. However, in order to understand how to perform dynamic analysis on the restored pod, it is important, as I said before, to adopt low-level um, tools that give you low-level visibility on execution, on connection, for example, Wireshark, sysdig open source, or Strace if you want to have visibility on syscalls, or you can also directly interact with the restored pod if you want, or adopt other kind of observability and security tools from the, security, from the open source landscape. 
And of course, in order to understand what uh, is happening within the uh, restored pod, you may want to collect all the evidences to make sure you have a whole picture of the impact that the attack could have. So, in our case, we have basically adopted Wireshark. No, I'm just joking. This is a, a cousin of Wireshark that uh, is Logray, released a few months ago, actually, and it is uh, able to um, view not network packets, but syscalls, and syscalls, uh, the syscalls in our case were captured with syslic open source. As you can see here, this tool that can be downloaded from the Wireshark website allows you to filtering as you did in um, uh, with, with Wireshark actually, but of course it is compliant to the um, fields related to the syscalls in this case. Here you are able to see, for example, the commands that were requested by the attacker. Uh, all of these are execuable syscalls that were executed in our restored pod. You can also see and get the network connections, for example, and um, here you can see how the, um, the bot sends the results back to the, to, the, to the attacker that has requested the ID, the LS under the root folder, or also the port scan results. And here, for example, the world port scan that was done against this specific kind of IP um, were shown here. So this is a brief recap regarding the dynamic analysis that can be performed, but of course you may want to use your own tools. And before wrapping it up, I will pass over to Stefan again. So thank you. Uh, this is just a recap about all the tools that we uh, saw today. Uh, mainly for pictures, uh, but uh, hopefully this can be a good recap for you guys if you want to uh, dig deeper into those tools and you want to start using them uh, and start dealing with container checkpoint, but just also for uh, static analysis and uh, dynamic analysis. Um, uh, that's just time for takeaways. Um, as we saw today, um, instant just uh, just to remember, instant response plan needs to be set. So if you don't have one, please uh, hurry up and create one. Uh, it also depends on which, uh, if you have containers or you just uh, just host, but host. But I think if you are all, if we are all here, I think we all need to deal with containers. So I guess we are all pretty impacted by by this. So it's very important to understand. Uh, where you are, understand the tools that you need to use and master them because they uh, might be useful uh, at some point. Might, maybe no, but who knows. Um, and of course, as we said uh, before, uh, automatic is always better than manual. And we saw today an example of how automatic things can be useful in order to get things in the right moment and not when it's too late or if something we need to do manual, it might be too late, especially for containers that are very, uh, very quick and we might need to have something uh, in, with, with, with better timing. Um, other thing that we discussed today, we saw different tools. Some of them are very old school, like GDB. Uh, it's not like a container, uh, specific container tool, but they are still valid. So uh, not all the tools that we, uh, that we talked last time, but also this time are just specific for container. Some of them are still old, old school tool that we used to do and we used to use in, uh, in host or on-prem um, forensic or, uh, or, an, or similar, um, uh, similar uh, engaging uh, engagement. So um, some of them are still valid. There are some new that you need to know and you need to be ready to use. Uh, for the rest, uh, is um, simulate the, the, your incident response plan and make sure that it's actually working and that the right people are involved. So m most of what we discussed also last time was mainly regarding uh, who needs to be involved in the, in, the, uh, in the incident response plan because this is not just about tools, right? It's about process, it's about people being involved into it so that they can um, rush things up if, if needed when something happens in your environment. 
And so we just want to close for references. Uh, this is where we get some yeah, some part of of what we uh, worked on, and just also a chance to credit people of all the work we just added a bit on a, a, like overall picture and overall feature that are are, are uh, in uh, uh, in the market. So uh, thanks to those people that worked on that, and hopefully we can see more things coming up for Checkpoint once the f the feature will be. Uh, broadly available. So thank you all. We are here for questions if you have some. Otherwise, again, we can wrap up. Thanks. Um, not sure. I mean, uh, of course, it depends on what you have checkpointed, and I think on the memory that was uh, that was checkpointing during the execution. Um, it is, I think, uh, reliable in order to to have much of the memory pages, but sometimes, of course, if you want to go much more in deeper for this static analysis, you may also want to, for example, collect the whole image, and uh, the, the, I mean, the, the whole state of the memory with other tools, for example, and then for analyze them with something like volatility in order to go much more in deeper. So I think one of the slides you said that checkpoint to container what does it do for container? What you mean? Wait. No, I think the latest This one? No. Keep on going. Static one? No, next one. Next one. So we are going into the dynamic. I think it might be dynamic, yeah. Go ahead, next one, maybe. Okay. This is restore <laughs> video, then. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe this one. No more than this. <laughs> we have just finished the dynamic one. If you want, I can get back to the static. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, we can we can address this offline. Uh, so no, no big deal. So thank you all. Have a good conference. And lunch. <laughs>